I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's block we call The Groundhog Sees Its Genre. We've all experienced deja vu, that sensation where we've been here or we've done this before. It's an odd feeling and one that can be truly disorienting. The main subject of today's discussion centers around a film that brilliantly captured this idea of the repeating time loop, if you will, and became the blueprint for many films to follow. Meteorologist Phil Connors finds himself trapped in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, while covering the annual celebration of the Groundhog. But it's not the unexpected blizzard that's keeping him there, as a mystical force finds Phil reliving the February 2nd holiday over and over again. Bill Murray stars in the Harold Ramis film, Groundhog Day, from 1993. When a PR liaison for the military is sent to the front lines of an alien invasion, he's almost immediately killed. At which point he wakes up and starts the day all over again. Like a video game with infinite lives, he will have to learn to harness this power and defeat the alien threat once and for all. Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt, and Bill Paxton star in All You Need Is Kill, or Live, Die, Repeat, I, I mean, Edge of Tomorrow from 2014. Two strangers at a wedding in Palm Springs find themselves stuck in a time loop having to live the day over and over again. Wait a minute, I feel like I just read this one. The two must find a way out of the loop or learn to cope with it. Kristen Milioti, Andy Samberg, and J.K. Simmons star in Palm Springs from 2020. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. Good day so far? Today, tomorrow, yesterday, it's all the same. You? Today's young. Ask me again at the end. By the way, that shirt, the, the, the Carpenters is the yeah. Carpenter Carpenters. Uh, that's so fucking <laughs> awesome, man. Unbelievable. Are, is this all through like vinegar syndrome or like, uh, you know, the fright rags, things like uh, that? This is at uh, Cinephile Video in uh, Santa Monica. They have a, one of the two one of the two video rental places there's supposed to be a really good one i want to say pasadena yeah that's that's one i would normally go to the the video tech yeah is that cool that's called yeah i got yeah it's really great we got to go there yeah exactly well and and that's the best part of the video store is you can you can browse browsing and just like oh wait i never thought about that yeah i'll i'll get that like if if you're searching for it you're not going to find it cuz you wouldn't have thought of it i'm just browsing yeah <laughs> Would you like me to take something out for you? <laughs> what a hype. Not like they used to mean something in this town. They used to pull the hog out and they used to eat it. You're hypocrites. All of you. All right. Welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster. And with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello. And how are you? Didn't you just read that intro? <laughs> Get me back from last week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll just play the end of last week's episode. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> Get your galoshes on, because it's cold outside. <laughs> Today we are talking about films. Um, well, I guess films that all fall within the, the genre that Groundhog Day, um, the subgenre <laughs> of time loop uh, yeah. that Groundhog Day pretty much presented in 1993. I think that that's probably the best way to describe this. Uh, if you've got a better way, Jeremy, please help yeah, me Yeah, I don't know. It's it's the Groundhog Day genre. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah, so today it's Groundhog Day, 1993, Edge of Tomorrow for 2014. Well, it, it depends on on which, which time you're looking at it. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it might have a different title, Live, but yeah, Edge of Tomorrow is the one I think of. <laughs> Live, Die, Repeat, I believe is the other one. Yeah, um, or what was it called? Anyway But Kill or something? What was the I thought it was Live, manga? Die, Repeat. There, there's Live, Die, Repeat. repeat. All you need is kill and edge of tomorrow. Oh, it's got a third title. I had no idea. They'll pick a title one of these days. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's from 2014, and then Palm Springs from 2020. So this one came out during uh, yeah. during the pandemic times. Pandemic times, exactly. Uh, this was uh, again. These movies were all the same movie, um, and I and I don't even mean <laughs> that like ironically. Like we watch the same thing over and over again, but really they they do follow a pattern, a very clear pattern, and. I'm really yeah. interested in getting into that with uh, this discussion. Yeah, it it's funny. Uh, you know, I saw Edge of Tomorrow in the theater, and same. You know, a, a friend had got the tickets for it, and I was just kind of tagging along. 
and I had no idea what it was. And, you know, you, you get like, you know, 10, 15 minutes into it, you're like, oh, wait, wait, wait it's Groundhog Day. But then you kind of forget. Yeah. Because you get so sucked into it. But it's funny, like this this genre itself, I mean, I guess was sort of established with Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day was kind of a, a big hit. And then, I don't know, it's, it's kind of been uh, remembered ever since. You know, it hasn't quite faded away like a lot of other films from 1983. But, uh, you know, because it became so successful, like, uh, I, I guess a guy who wrote a short story in the 70s called, like, it was like 1201 or something like that, uh, wanted to, like, sue Groundhog Day because it was essentially, they ripped off his story. <laughs> and his story got turned into a short film in, I think, the early 90s, and then a feature film in 1993. <laughs> so, it's like... Um, and that one was was called 1201 or something, but it was like, I don't remember you know, it was, it was that totally, movie. totally forgotten. Was it just like not, not a wide release or not not a popular film? I mean, it's if early 90s, that'd be around the same time, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. So, so the short film that was based on this short story came out in 1990. But then I guess, I guess it was a TV movie. Okay. Uh, called 1201. It was like a you know, feature length TV movie that came out in 1993 same year as this and it and the tv movie has uh like uh jeremy piven and, and wow. martin landau in it what really <laughs> wow yeah well so, so when we do our sequel to this exactly. uh, groundhog day thing i was just gonna say we'll have to, we'll have to do that when one we yeah. do happy death day and the other yeah, ones that just yeah. follow the same rules here <laughs> right exactly boss level or whatever boss yeah. Level, exactly yeah uh, rewatching Groundhog Day. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen this one, and I've probably seen it over a hundred yeah, times same. at this point. Um, same. Yeah. And I remembered all the lines. Uh, just like it still cracks me up in the same parts every every time. Um, and I really got engaged with the story yet again. Like I think it's really a, a great movie. Um, I love the his transformation. I think is just really well presented on screen um, in so many different facets, and he's got to cover all yeah. facets of his life or facets of like how he can be generous and how he can stop being so uh, self-indulgent I guess or you know self-centered um, and he really yeah. they really did a great job of that and um, I think that this did establish a lot the, the scenes were all shot so like close to one another that you really felt like you were watching the same day over and over again they really nailed it you know it it's true and and especially with like the, the location work I mean it's like mm-hmm. yeah that seems like a huge challenge to get that weather to look the same every day and like <laughs> you know every I mean, day it, can't yeah, you hear it, that sound in your or the song in your head pick up yeah. your paper and turn it up on <laughs> do, 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 do. that's i don't even know what they're gonna go see the groundhog <laughs> well where are you going to hop cobbler's knob it's groundhog day <laughs> <laughs> probably got the name wrong there but i just know the sound of it at this point but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's just a, it's a fun one um and bill murray is obviously brilliant in this um but man that guy can steal yeah, steal a scene i i feel like this is like the last uh movie in the in the bill murray like before he became sort of postmodern bill murray where he's like sort of depressed bill murray i think this is one of the last ones where it's like that where it's like you know, he's leading man Bill Murray in this, you know, like, you know, Stripes and, and Ghostbusters and whatever else. Yeah. Um, and, and this might have, might have been the sort of end of that. Yeah, uh, I agree. Phase of his, his career or whatever. You know, it kind of revolved around his um, cynical attitude and, and some of these things that he was able to display, but also be kind of lovable and whatever. And like, you know... Uh, more on the lovable spectrum, I think, was the the Peter Venkman character, but um, yeah. you know, it's it, it's the same, you know, Bill Murray type. Yeah. Um, and it's funny this one in particular. It's okay. It's a lot like Scrooge. I was gonna say that. You know, it's a little I mean, throttled back he, though of Scrooge, but yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah, but 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 even to the point where like he he's like trying to save the like the homeless guy. Mm-hmm. I remember in Scrooge, he yeah. like, finds the guy in the the sewer. Oh or whatever. man, Herman. Yeah. Oh man, that part creeped me out as a kid, man, because he was sitting there with the old school watch, pocket watch, I mean to say. Yeah. No, it, and it's funny because, like, despite all those sort of similarities, and, you know, obviously, you know, Harold Ramis was at, at the center of a lot of those movies. Like, and apparently, this is the last one they did together because uh, it's sort of infamously falling out there. Uh, you know, their, their friendship fell apart because of this movie. What, what, what was it about this movie that made their friendship fall apart, though? I don't know the details yeah, of I mean, that. 
I don't know. I mean, I you know maybe I should look that up before bringing it up. No, but I, I know, but you know, I, I I just know sort of in general that this is like something that like sort of ended their uh, their their you know working relationship and at least. Um, but yeah, I mean the the the, the cast of this movie is great. I mean, uh, yeah. you, you know, I I forgot how funny Chris Elliott was in this. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> when and, he takes back you know, his it, tip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or it's like you know he he goes up for the uh, for for the like the auction or whatever and he's got that like that strut and he's like sir, do, <laughs> give us a little twirl there Chris Two and bits like yeah. sold <laughs> for twenty five cents yeah I love that because I oh, think man. Phil Connors goes for like three thousand bucks or whatever was in uh, the checkbook right she's reading directly from her yeah book, exactly from yeah. her balance sheet there yeah. <laughs> right but then you know. Obviously, Stephen Tobolowsky yes. is incredible. Brian Doyle Murray. I mean, Rick Ducumin. Uh, you, as you pointed out, uh, Michael Shannon's in this. <laughs> like, Crazy! I had no idea. Probably one of his earlier roles. I had no idea. That was that was one of the funniest. Scenes. <laughs> He's like, no way! WrestleMania. <laughs> And, and he's like, what, like 19 Young. in this movie? So you can see a lot of the actors that were in this movie were a lot of Chicago um, stage people. Like uh, Michael yeah. Shannon, obviously, was one of those from, from from theater out there in Chicago. And then Dave Pasquese is his therapist, the one that's like, you know, <laughs> Yo, I usually yeah, yeah, deal yeah. with uh, marital yeah. problems, and uh, he, but this is a uh, little different for me. <laughs> Julia Lee drives his uh, ex-husband in, in Veep. Yes. Right? Ex- oh, man, is he hilarious in Veep. <laughs> He is so great in that, yeah. He's like the the Bill Clinton character in he that. Is a, he's just a, a an incredible improviser from Chicago. He had a, a team, TJ and Dave, that were, you know, every week on Wednesday nights, they would put on an improv, imp, improv show that was mind-blowing. And people, wow. it, would, it would pack every week. Um, I, I used to go constantly. I've probably seen him 10, 15 times. It was great. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and, and weren't you saying that this movie was shot? In Out, Chicago or outside you know, of Chicago, outs- yeah, outside of Chicago. I think it's called. Um, I can't think. Of- <laughs> Where outside of Chicago? I don't know. St. Louis, <laughs> <laughs> Indiana. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it was it was in Chicago. I, I can't think of the name right now, but I think that they the town where they did all of the facade work and all the construction for the movie to make it look like Punxsutawney. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they leaned into that, and you know, it kind of you know drove a little bit up the tourism of that area for a while, and you know, you could leave. Yeah. Uh, the name of the restaurant that they go to, and Punxsutawney Phil's, I don't know what, he's on a stage or something for yeah, the- <laughs> that, that, that little, like, stump thing. <laughs> they used to take the rat out, and they used to eat it. You're all a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> I, love gonna, like, I love, you know, like, by, like, it's got to be, like, the thousandth time for him doing that th- that opening. Right, and he's right. like, and now in small Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, yada, yada, yada. And he does, like, he just, like, totally fucking had it with him by the end of the, <laughs> that movie, man. It's so great. And, I, you know, you can kind of see that maybe Bill Murray also does kind of have that attitude. Because think about what he had to go through uh, for that, especially the Stephen Tobolowsky stuff, you know, like, Ned yeah. over and over again, and then stepping into that <laughs> ice puddle. That's a doozy. <laughs> Ned? Ned wow. the head? Yeah. <laughs> Needlehead Ned? <laughs> it's like, did you go pro with that belly button thing? Or? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. <laughs> But then I like that he kind of turned around that that discussion with Ned, and then he used it to to get to to go to bed with that one one girl. He said, "Oh yeah, I've known you from high school. Remember, weren't we in uh, Mrs. Oh, Whatever's right, class?" Right, and right. <laughs> Terrible. He keeps calling her Rita. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, and and the guy who like who meets him outside his front door. Every morning, no, see- <laughs> he's, he's like, "Are you going to see the Groundhog?" Like he was the guy in Home Alone. Who is the mall Santa yeah, or whatever? Exactly, who like yeah. he's like, put out your little paw there. I'll give you a little tic tacs. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, like th- that guy in particular. Like I think he was. It, it definitely Chicago it gave it that provisor. Chicago feel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. he was. I mean, Home Alone as well, right? That was all North Shore Chicago. Yeah. I did want to mention one more thing about uh, one of the. Uh huh. Oh shit! I'm blanking on his name. The guy from uh, the Burbs. Rick Ducumin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man. <laughs> He and his buddy, when they're, how about some flapjacks? Yeah. Too early for flapjacks? <laughs> it's like a, ordering from the cop. Yeah, that's what they always tell you. you. You know, always tie your shoes. Be nice to your sister. 
Yeah, don't drive on the railroad track. Oh, that's one I happen to agree with there, bud. <laughs> but let, so I think that that like you know the important thing obviously is like the format of of these movies or this template that Groundhog Day um, basically set for all of these movies. Um, oh, uh huh, yeah, yeah. And then I mean. But I think that each of the movies kind of change that up a bit and each of them have their own version of like that opener or that like cold opener. Palm Springs gets right into it. Like you're you're already in the loop technically yeah. from one of well, their it, perspectives. Apparently the um the original draft that uh Harold Ramis, you know, took over, it started in the middle, just like in Palm Springs. Like they were already in the middle of the time loop. Wow. So then it was just about him in that. And I guess uh, Harold Ramis or or one of the producers was like, hey, maybe it would be good to see his reaction to this happening to him. You know what I mean? Right. And it's funny because like in Palm Springs, they start with that that beginning. But since we have a second character in the loop, right, we get to have her reaction. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it's like you know, we, we, we still get the same. But you're right. You need that reaction. Ability to like, wait, what's going on? Yeah. Because you need to. I mean, that's I, that couldn't be more mind altering. Yeah, exactly. Like the end of Dead yeah. of Night, right? That guy just keeps waking up and he's pulling into right. the house like, uh, this isn't right. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is, is Dead of Night the, uh, the the original Groundhog Day? Possibly. I mean, the, the overall, uh, you know, what do we call it? The spine of it was, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what if we started Groundhog Day where Dead of Night ended? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and it's like, what else is fascinating is like, Unlike the other two movies, it's just, it's never explained. It's just, it happens and then it unhappens. And that beginning and end and like, you know, how it, it happened and how it, how it ended, um, I guess is where the interpretation comes down uh, for you, which, which makes it a really interesting film. Um, and it's funny, on, on that note, it's like, every time I had, I'd seen it before, I always had this interpretation in my mind that oh it's like uh the typical hollywood story of oh love conquers all and that that gets us out of the the time loop as as long as uh he you know finds love he's good to go Mm -hmm. which is you know the normal sort of uh resolution on a story like this right um in this one you know watching it again it was like uh that wasn't quite what it was because i'd kind of forgotten about his opening series of you know the, the, the women he was with um, how he even tries to get Andy McDowell to fall in love with him, and that doesn't work. He, you know, trying all these different things uh, doesn't work. And the only thing that sort of works is by him spending his entire time trying to do whatever he can to make the world better. Yes. Uh, in in the only way he can. And it's interesting because, like, you know, like even with that that homeless story, I remember. You know, think, thinking about this uh, in, in in a different context and like and how sort of irritating it was that the the film seemed to be sort of shrugging off like oh and it it even has a line about like oh it's uh you know too bad homeless people too bad uh, people who are poor sometimes people just die oh bummer you know what I mean and but and, she did say old age though uh, she did she did but you know clearly that wasn't it because it's like you know his, he's out in the elements and all these other things right oh no I I understand that but yeah I get yeah. What you're saying, yeah. Sometimes people just die. Not today. But I think that was just sort of uh, an accidental emblematic character in in this. Because, like, I think what the movie was getting at was that, like, it's not about, you know, putting all your eggs into one basket of an an individual and, like, trying to, you know, save save this one thing. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, put your energies into um, making sure that this one outcome is what's important, but rather to sort of like, you know, spread things around as best you can and leave the place better than you found it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea is, okay, if everyone approached life that way, uh, you know, we'd all benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, in this movie, he's uh, just sort of one insufferable, selfish asshole learning that. uh, And until he did, he was sort of stuck in the Puxatawney purgatory, I guess. Right. Right. And like, (laughs) so, I, you know, I think that uh, kind of elevates this movie in, in a lot of ways, like specifically because of the, the ambiguities I, of some of those. Exactly. Things. And it's, is that amb- ambiguous 
figure that made him go through this. I mean, that's the universe you're talking about or something bigger than we can even put our finger or, or, you know, put a, a name to it's, it's Lovecraftian, if you will. It's yeah. Eldritch. yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, it, it very well may have that, you know, spiritual component. I mean, uh, I'm sure that that was, you know, part of what they were, they were doing, although it is never really like pointed to directly. I'm sure a Dan Aykroyd uh, version of this script would have, uh, Gozer, <laughs> Go- Gozer is the one that put him in this time loop. Right, right. Or, or you know, it isn't he kind of famous for like uh, UFOs you know, and getting excited about aliens and stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely some sort, some some ET event. <laughs> right, exactly. But yeah, I, that's that's really profound. I like I like really liked how you put that. I think that you're right. I think it was him putting himself out there to make everyone around him. And the world a better place, and he really, yeah. they really nailed that when he's catching the kid from the tree, and then basically yeah, exactly. everyone gets, everyone gets a little moment from him in the day, you know, when he's jacking up the old lady's car to get their yeah. tire. <laughs> you never thank me. You never thank me. <laughs> You're gonna thank me today. No, it, 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 exactly, and it's not that just that he got WrestleMania tickets for these guys, or you know, saved Brian Doyle Murray from choking, or <laughs> um, you know, did this or did that. It's like you know, it's not sort of one individual thing and it's not like the only thing that got him out of it was yeah exactly like like making it uh better for everybody type of thing i i guess you know for me like the one sort of like um uh slash on the pot or, or the sort of imperfection in the movie is is a lot of times the sort of score of, of the soundtrack like you know it, it gives it this real you know layer unnecessary layer of cheese interesting you know i i mean i can't even think of it i mean i i know what you're saying especially the the opening title score um i do not yeah. like <laughs> kind, kind of synthy like um almost still 80s or late 80s into yeah. the early 90s which would make sense but yeah i get what you're saying yeah i mean this is we're barely getting into the 90s here it's like it's kind of had a I weekend mean, I... at bernie's uh <laughs> feel at, right like the opening yeah, score yeah, yeah. um yeah. And, it, and i guess i just haven't didn't really pick up on that i i just think as, as a cast, like you said, this ensemble that they put together, everyone is so good in their moment. Even the piano teacher, who has a very yeah. small role in a way, but but such a... <laughs> Here's a thousand dollars. Kicks that kid out. But I love that she's like, this is your first lesson. He's like jamming already, you know? It's, yeah. <laughs> wow, all right. <laughs> but yeah, I no, mean, exactly. everyone was great. Um, but I mean, but but that's, that's the whole thing. It's like that, you know, aside from sort of the... Uh, the the message of it or the sort of the, the philosophical ideas in it, you know, it is like super entertaining. Yeah. And the, and the thing is like, you know, it starts off and it's very cynical uh, because Bill Murray is very cynical and we're sort of seeing everything from his perspective. And then things get pretty dark and we, we're also, you know, in his perspective for that. Uh, but, you know, it's real dark. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But like there are a couple moments where it gets a little too earnest and the music is really cheesy, but everything else is just, it's so entertaining and so funny and it keeps you hooked in that, in that level that like, you know, you're able to sort of forgive, I guess, some of the shortcomings and in some of the style choices and whatever. Yeah. I'm wondering, or at least I am. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. Um, I, I love, cause I've seen this movie so much. I like to think about, you know, like outside of what we're presented on screen. And I was always thinking, I'm like, if he was in some sort of, you know, multi-dimensional like string theory, you know, when it keeps popping up a different version of, you know, your choices that you make. Mm-hmm. And if he had all these, you know, thousands of them, millions, maybe who knows how long he was doing this. Right. Um, right. So, you know, if there's all these, then are these all these versions of him like blowing up in a car after stealing a groundhog, fa- jumping yeah. off of the building, you know, like and because we kind of see in those moments the dialogue of the people that are around after that. And in, 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 in fact, one of them, when he jumped off the building, Andy McDowell and Chris Elliott actually go to oh, right. identify yeah, the yeah. body. So we see quite a few hours or so after this actually happens. So we do yeah. kind of see a, more timelines that could potentially have gone on, you know, but you, you're right. Like yeah. several, several instances where he kills himself. When he blows up in the car, they, they, they make a comment. He's like, well, he, he may have made it. <laughs> well, probably not now. Nah. That's a cool <laughs> shot, by the way, when they zoom back on the, on the yeah. explosion, it's got a nice feel to it. Yeah. 
and uh, or like when he he drops the toaster and we, we see the that's the scary who owns right? the B and B like oh oh my goodness <laughs> you know whatever she's so good did you did you yeah. want to talk about the weather or are you just uh, having small talk <laughs> just chit chat <laughs> <laughs> just on that point about uh, I blew your mind didn't I yeah you did the string theory <laughs> just on the the point of like of sort of breaking perspective yeah we, we only do that a couple times in this movie and. It, it is interesting that it's it's always around the time where he kills himself. I mean, you know, the first time was when the car blew up and we got that punchline from uh, Chris Elliott. But, you know, each time after that, I, I guess it's it's also uh, to see the reaction, to, you know, his death. It's more cinematic. Yeah, and maybe that's part of it. Now, I think in the next movie, we don't do that at all. In, in Edge of Tomorrow or Live, Die, Repeat or... Better more than kill or whatever it was called. What was it? Better more, good more. All you need is kill. That's what it was. <laughs> really, I uh, did not know that. Well, that was the manga it was based off. Of, I guess, and that was what how they started shooting it. It's like if you look at all the slates on the BTS or whatever, like that's what the they they were calling it. Uh, and then it became Edge of Tomorrow, and then became Live Die Repeat. Uh, anyway, but um, in Edge of Tomorrow, every time he dies, uh, Tom Cruise, that is. We don't get to see what happens after that. There's no sort of punchline moment or no. reaction to him. Very, dying. very quick cut right to him waking up on the in, in cuffs again in his officer's uniform. Get up, maggot! <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to go backwards a little bit here, but I think I just may have solved my own question here. Okay, go for it. The time loop in Groundhog Day would start at 6 a.m. every morning. Right when the clock would... That's, the, the th- that's true. Uh-huh. So when Andy McDowell and Chris Elliott went to see the body, it could have been during the day because he kills himself during the day. So it wouldn't have been 6 a.m. yet. So the loop didn't start yet. So maybe this mm-hmm. guy just <laughs> is a dead body for the rest of the day until 6 a.m. rolls around. And oh, then right, it starts right, right. Back yeah. up. For, for everyone in that string or whatever, or in, in, in that uh, different branch of, the, of time, they get to continue on until 6 a.m., and then the next it should, day or whatever. It should and go then back. It, and then it then it resets and they forget. Right. Yeah. Which is how Palm Springs works. But let's not jump ahead. You're... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so Edge of Tomorrow. Um, first of all, I also saw this in the theater like you did. I was lucky enough mm-hmm. to go to an advanced screening of it. And Tom Cruise introduced it with uh, Chris Hardwick. It was for like a, ner- oh, wow. a Nerdist event. Um, but Tom Cruise actually came out and he's like, me and Mick Q, you know, Christopher McQuarrie, I think he calls him like Mick Q or uh-huh. something. It's like yeah, me and yeah, Mick yeah. Q, man, this this script just was made it, you know, it was for me. We had to do this together. It's just action packed. Doug directing this thing, man. It was just incredible. He was like so amping it up. And I think it's a pretty <laughs> amped up movie. It's pretty well done. And Doug Lyman, I think, is a is a great action director. Yeah, I you know, it's funny, like the the movie, um I remember as soon as it started, I was like, oh, wait, another Tom Cruise science fiction movie? What the hell? It doesn't and have I, a great opening. It does not, actually. You're right. Our, what I'll say is the first time we see the, the landing at Normandy, it's not that great. And the sort of like a little um, you know, video opening, sitting in the That's what I'm talking scene, about. Like, like, that's not so hot. Yeah. I, I do like the first interaction with you know, Brendan Gleeson. Yes. But, um, yeah. But anyway, I, what I was going to say was, like, this came out, like, I think right after Oblivion. Oh. And I was like, oh, it's just the same movie, because it, it kind of ends in a very similar way. But uh, watching it again, it, it, it was definitely, I was like, oh, this, is, this movie's actually pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I And I think, you know, there's some of that, that weakness there we just talked about with the, the opening. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish Brendan Gleeson was in it more as well, but. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, he, was, he was pretty good. Oh, and also, um, oh my God, what's his name? Bill Paxton. Oh man, uh, yeah, <laughs> makes me sad to see him. He's so good in this too. Where are you from in Kentucky, Sarge? A little town called Science Hill. Why well, they call it Science Hill? Never ask. Don't care. He nails yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, and 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 you're kind of buying it that it, that he's like, oh, Tom Cruise is talking his way out of this one or whatever, and it's like, nope. And <laughs> he's like, he's like you, you've come for retribution, son. Like, you, you'll get it in combat. <laughs> He's awesome. I, I I miss that guy. Yeah, same. Uh, no, I mean it's it, it's such a bummer. Um, yeah, in, in, in so many uh, great movies. Um, but um, you know what it was? I I think the thing about the Normandy landing the first time we see it, it was too much. It was kind of overwhelming. But like, 
and it's it's supposed to be because we've kind of seen it from Tom Cruise's perspective, and he's like, well, I was in JROTC or whatever when I was in high school, but I, you know, I've been doing comms ever since. Blah, like blah. A marketing dude, yeah, yeah, and like you know, so he's not a soldier, and he gets in there and he gets his ass handed to him. Mm-hmm. Okay, but like I think it was just uh, having to be you know, plunged so uh, forcefully into this like world of silly mech suits or whatever. Oh yeah, and 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 I think I think that kind of like uh, you know got me a little disoriented where i'm like uh, i don't know if i can handle this movie but then w- once it gets going with the the looping it starts getting really interesting i agree and with I you think, yeah yeah i mean it's like I, like i was really really hooked on it and then you know maybe the very end that sort of third act when it's like when they get out of the looping but they've got to do it for real this time you know, and and it gets a little crazy, I guess. But uh, whatever, okay. You you, you just kind of end well, because he and... can't Morpheus you through the entire battlefield yeah. <laughs> anymore, right? So, and I think yeah, that, wh- that was which is good because you, you you need that for his character exactly. Sure, to, like, I mean, there you need not to... have the invincibility code right because exactly he would be the invincible guy that played Mega Man two for the five hundredth time and can get to Doctor Wily with no problem. <laughs> That's exactly what this movie is, right? Like it, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a guy. No, it's a video game. Yeah, no, it's one hundred percent a video game. Um, but I really like that. Um, um, those mo- the the like you said in that second act when it's really really caked in with the with the looping, and I think that the yeah. first of all the editing of the looping when he's getting better at stuff and everything it, it's had that same yeah. vibe of you know Bill Murray getting better at the piano and things like yeah. that. But in this instance, <laughs> he's getting better at killing these mimics and these yeah. octopus uh, uh, whatever those alphas were. Right. And he was just getting yeah. better at uh, doing that. And I thought it was interesting how they did it. And again, I think Doug Lyman can can shoot really fun uh, choreographed action. Yeah, no, it, like all that stuff, I, you know, totally working for me. Like yeah. the, the sort of like the mystery part of it, the like <laughs> and and you're right, the, the sort of the, the way that like the editing got really strong at those moments mm-hmm. where. You know, it's like, yeah, two fingers. Okay, we're going on to the next part of this. You, you know, you know the drill. Like, <laughs> like when he when he tried to escape from doing the PT and he rolled under the truck a couple times. Yeah. Oh fuck! And he's <laughs> just like, <laughs> actually, there were some great there, deaths. Th- there's an instance where where we 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 break perspective. Yeah. You, you see Bill Paxton like, what the fuck? This Good idiot. Oh <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, so, so there we go. Uh, this movie is like all the other movies. <laughs> we do break the perspective at, at, at certain points. But yeah, I mean, like the sort of uh, action and, and uh, mystery and him trying to like solve this and, and trying to like, get to... Uh, the Alpha? Or the... Is it the Omega? The what, Omega. What, Sorry, that, yeah, you're right. That, that thing? The Omega. The like, you know, the brain bug or whatever in he, this one. he was the Alpha, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the brain bug yeah exactly we needed yeah. we needed doogie hauser to get in there neil patrick harris yeah. is gonna mind meld with the, with the brain bug right, with, right, the, right. with the omega um and then you know we need to get to the whatever device and uh that that'll show you where the thing's at and you know okay all, all of that stuff was was working pretty well and i think um even the sort of like love story in it was uh was okay especially because we do see him like do that scene where he's like at the helicopter or whatever and he's like okay i can't get past this level or whatever like, basically you know? yeah <laughs> you can't get past this level yeah <laughs> in two player contra the second player never makes it out of this one yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> right well and, and then he does it again on, on a solo mission and, and seems to get there and finds out that it it's not real or whatever right and all that you know held my attention it was very intriguing it was very riveting um i think so too yeah but what's funny is like uh, <laughs> So this movie, it's like okay, you take Groundhog Day, Starship Troopers, and the Matrix. Very much it, these are sort Troopers. of like the, the the like I don't know the little bot things in the Matrix that eat up their ship right, or whatever. Yeah. Are the Squid, mimics squids? Yeah, but also isn't wasn't mimic an alien movie with uh, kind of like squiddy creatures I, in it? I, I don't remember it to be honest. I, I know I saw it, but so long ago. I, I don't remember yeah. that one. Um, I think that was Guillermo del Toro's first uh, U.S. Oh, film. Oh, yeah. 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 But yeah, I, I think that this one definitely borrows from quite a few. Uh, the beginning of it felt like Starship Troopers, and I thought it's either they're going to go into heavy satire like Starship Troopers did, um, but the tone of the movie yeah. completely shifts from that first uh, found footage, or I'm sorry, uh, like stock footage opener. That's of right. All that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and it kind of would you like to know more? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. what I felt it's like. Kind of like one of those things. Yeah. Click on this to, to know more. Yeah. Oh, okay. The, that that's what kind of made that. I not only was the some of the sort of green screening in 
of the news footage like not convincing for some reason. I mean, like I, I don't know what the special effects budget was limited there for some reason. Right. But everything um, else looked rad. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then on top of that, they had this like weird earnestness about it that like Starship Troopers presented as ironic. Right. And that part of it also wasn't wasn't working so hot. Um, there uh, another thing about the opening. I feel like that was one of those tacked on type things like i feel like that could have been done in post that could have been someone watching the movie and be like there's no context to what's going on here you know we need a whole opener of who these right. aliens are and why they're and so you had to make this little montage if you will of you know found, like the you know stock footage plus a little bit of the bad yeah the bad news footage but everything else in that movie even the cg aliens i'm sold on even the ones yeah. that are really close up to screen that have, you know, like like we were talking about those key frames that always show up. You know, they kind of like <laughs> rear back and they do the same yeah, they, thing. They, yeah, they do the, you know, the same head move. Yeah, yeah but but I still, I, I, I enjoyed them. I thought that they were really well done. And I really liked the fact that a lot of the fighting happened during the day in this one. You could really see yeah. all the stuff happening. And you could right. see the monsters and how they would come up from the ground and all that. I thought that was great. No, that's true. And I, all that stuff w- was working for me yeah. uh, later. I mean, I think... Uh, there's just a, a couple moments of like corniness. I, I think it's like that opening thing where you're talking about the other sort of like uh, you know um, background players, uh, like uh, you know grunts J- that that J-Squad. Tom Cruise was hanging out with. Yeah, exactly. J Squad. Like, uh, you know, th- some of them like were, were better than others. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think they all got more convincing than others. I don't think they all got a great moment either. Like, I think that they were, you know, they yeah. they just kind of gave them a line as opposed to like giving them a function. And if that's they, the case, they really wanted to make the colonial Marines yes. uh, from aliens, but it's but like, you don't, you, know, you don't have the, you know, the, the drill instructor. You didn't get the, like, you always were an asshole Gorman. You didn't get the like, Hey Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? <laughs> exactly. No, have you? <laughs> Every day is like a banquet in the Marines. <laughs> I love the core. I love the core. I love that part, man. But I, I agree with you in that, that whole scene, especially with, and you also have Bill Paxton, right? So it's got a, a yeah. very aliens feel to it. Like I, right, I, I right, feel right. like there's a lot. But again, I'm sure Doug Lyman or whoever wrote this has is a huge fan of these movies, and there's definite inspiration taken. But they didn't have that group um, of yeah. Marines that were so personable, and like they all, you all felt when they when they went. Like these guys were almost just. Like you said, background players or NPCs, they call them in games, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Killed off, <laughs> you know? they, they were just the guys to like orient you to where the map room is or whatever in the video game. <laughs> Especially the big guy that gets the, the whole okay, this ship. This is how you reload. Yeah, yeah the whole guy. ship falling on. This is how you dodge. And he gets hit by, you know. <laughs> He didn't dodge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I am a little confused by the ending of this one, although I think that, you know, it was it was nicely cut and they got out of it really quick, but it, this was a hard one to end. I feel because once they go into the last loop, when he, they drop the, all the grenades, um, when Tom Cruise basically is dying and then he drops all the grenades into the mm-hmm. Omega and then everything gets wiped back to when he wakes up and then everything's fine. I was confused on what happened in regular time. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or well, you know in the, I, I, I know what you're saying. And I, I think, the explanation is supposed to be, and I, I think you're right to question that because I, I don't think it works, but I, I think the explanation is supposed to be the same way that we got into the Normandy landing being so disastrous. Oh, they didn't the, the, know the that they were is, coming. Just, the, the thing is over because, you know, uh, the Omega didn't see that day. brain bug w- was, was dead or whatever. Yeah. And so, but yeah, I mean, he got some more of the time travel goop into him as he died, and he reset time somewhere else. Yeah, it, it doesn't quite work. Or what they should have just done was have his death mean something. And great, he saved the world. Right. And uh, we we cut back to Brendan Gleeson, uh, and he's like, "Well, uh, we're good to go here, folks." How right. strong? How strong of an ending do you think it would be if? You know, right after all that stuff goes down, he blows up the brain bug and it kind of goes to black. And then we we start over as if we do. But instead of him being there in the um, is, is he in luggage like from the plane? Like he, he wakes up like in, yeah. in a pile with his handcuffs on. What if he's not there? <laughs> and what if that's yeah, exactly. that's how we end? You know what I mean? He, he did kind of give himself 
up into the time loop or whatever, you know, he really did sacrifice himself for, for everyone. Mm-hmm. But they, I guess they needed to have another moment with Emily Blunt when she does her, um, <laughs> strange yoga Your pose downward to, dog or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> did they need to do that every time like that was that was the thing yeah, yeah but um yeah i guess they needed to but did he have to convince her again now <laughs> well the way it ends she's like what do you want and he's like uh romantic comedy <laughs> yeah i did i Cut wasn't i wasn't a total fan of the ending of that at all um <laughs> and also i was thinking i'm like so this guy went through all this stuff with this woman fell in love with her like they really had like a thing going on like through this time loop and now he's got to like what try to convince her that hey I saved the world. She's like, who the hell are you? What'd you do? You yeah. know, <laughs> we were... you, didn't, you didn't save shit. The thing just ended. <laughs> you were in the JROTC, man. You know? Yeah. No, but 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 she had been through the time loop, so she knew. Uh, right. Yeah. She so could, she would uh, understand at least sympathize. Unless the time loop didn't happen because of that. <sighs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> w- w- what they really needed was like. Let's leave it open so we can have a sequel just in case. I mean, I, I thought that they were talking about having one. I, I know that it was definitely in discussion because I think this movie did pretty well. Yeah. D- despite the, the like uh, brand confusion about what was the name of that movie again? But did they do that when it was still in the theaters or when it, when it uh, was released on like Blu-ray and all that? They started changing yeah, I mean, the title. I think it was, yeah, for, for streaming and for Blu-rays and uh, all that, I believe. Um, and, and in fact, I think if you go to like search for it on Netflix or whichever streaming thing it's on right now. Uh, it shows up as lived. I repeat. That's what I watched. Dash fucking edge of tomorrow. That's <laughs> what like... I watched was lived. I repeat dash uh, edge of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Well, cause like edge of tomorrow was the name of the movie. Mm-hmm. Lived. I repeat was sort of like the poster tagline. Exactly. And they turned that into the, t- and then they, they switched that to the damn title. <laughs> The marketing team was just feeling themselves a little too much on this one. I, I feel like that too. But are you supposed to watch it like three times in a row and like you know really live the experience that Tom Cruise does? You know of this repeated world. Yeah, exactly. You watch it with three different titles and see if it changes the movie at all. I like the name of the manga. That'd have been an interesting title. All you need is kill. Yeah. I mean, Edge of Tomorrow does make sense from a geographical time standpoint i guess you literally are on the edge of tomorrow at all times because it's today (laughs) but plus i mean you know it kind of gives you a sense of yeah you're right like like what you're about to get into i mean i what was wrong with it just leave the goddamn title yeah i mean (laughs) i I know for a fact that things really don't do well when you change the name of something and someone's searching for it yeah (laughs) no exactly but palm springs has a good title that um i'm sure that it was the title of the script all the way through because this is a very palm springs heavy movie about palm springs and it's got a great great shots of palm springs so i mean it's uh not the only movie that can take place in palm springs so it seems kind of weird that it uh has that title (laughs) uh unlike edge of tomorrow where it kind of like makes you feel like you're about to uh get somewhere but can't and it's like oh what, what does that mean and like we well, can try to figure it out palm springs well it's just a place uh you know it's like they could have called it burbank right or irvine, irvine. you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think yeah, this exactly. was uh, your first time seeing this andy sandberg uh, comedy yeah uh it, it, was, it was pretty interesting like i i was um it's funny <laughs> this movie too I, I i wasn't uh too excited about when i was first starting it uh it it got better and better and it's pretty fun i then got sort of into it well once you know the second act started yeah but like but you know it 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 was a lot of fun and um i think this one too like sort of started running out of steam Hmm. but i but this one started running out of steam earlier for me it's like you know essentially right after the uh arrest by the side of the road scene you know this one was sort of the opposite of Groundhog Day because it does do the like love conquers all more or less at the end. And it's like, yeah, even though they were trying to be, you know, very ironic about it, they're, they're trying to be very postmodern about it. Uh, I mean, that is essentially what was happening. And like, even as they were stepping into the sort of cave light and going to blow themselves up, it's like, that's almost the place to end it with this current draft anyway. Cut to black, you mean? Like to finish the film there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you could do that and then get the, like, credits going, and then we do the sort of mid-credit thing where it's like, hey, your girlfriend said that, blah, 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 like, and, and then you'd kind of know what happened. Uh, or maybe not. Like, you, you could kind of, like, let that, I, let I that would, stay or I not I like stay. the ambiguity of it. I, w- I would have hoped that they'd ended on the uh, giant explosion. 
when yeah. they themselves killed the brain bug that was living inside the cave or, or whatever <laughs> was in there. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like this one, it actually, it, it kind of didn't deserve the ambiguity part of it. You, you just wanted like a, a solid plot because, um, interesting. It didn't, it didn't have the same sort of level of like interpretation or whatever as Groundhog Day, where it's like you're able to like, uh, you know, draw something out of it. I mean, it, you know, it's like, it's like what? It's like some sort of metaphor about, okay, millennials need to grow up sometime. Uh, they need to get their mm. shit together, fall in line. Uh, look, Peter Pan, it's time to grow up. I mean, it, it's weird. It's like uh, love conquers all, and uh, you, you just find someone who, you know, makes your dick work, and uh, you'll find the meaning of life. You know what I mean? It's like... Interesting. What else is interesting is like, okay, so speaking of the sort of perspective thing that we've been talking about through all these movies, it's like, okay, in in this case, it's uh, really supposed to be the Kristen... Uh, Melati, or however you say her name, uh, character. Mm -hmm. She's the one who learns about the time loop and all that. Through her piano lessons. Of Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Her version of that, right? Getting better through education. Right, exactly. And and she got got her piano lessons in astrophysics or quantum physics or whatever the hell it was. Yeah, Uh, he's like, oh, what? Yeah, I can't help you. I can't help you. What what are you asking me these questions for? You have all the answers. (laughs) I like those uh, montages, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so it's like, you know, 30 million years later, she got it or whatever. Exactly, yeah, how long? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you have to hit reset every day. Um, But but what's interesting is, okay, so we we kept seeing everything from her, her perspective, you know, getting into the time loop, you know, experiencing the time loop, you know, getting depressed in the time loop and all these things. And since Love Conquers All becomes sort of the through line through all of it, it's weird that, like, in the part where the love starts to conquer all, she's not there. It's all from Andy Sandberg's perspective. And then we get the whole, like, find your Irvine speech and all this. Because that's not her pursuit at that point. Her pursuit is just to get out of the loop. Right, right. But, like, the... The way, she she gets out of the loop. <laughs> uh, unlike Groundhog Day, you know, in Groundhog Day, it was like, you know, you become a better person. And this one, it's just like, you know, you blow yourself up through a cave or whatever. But it's it's weird because, like, it seemed as if the love story was that was was a, a big part of that uh, that whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So they didn't do a great job of, like, having her sort of reciprocate that love story. It was it was more or less a punchline to like, hey, you got one run on sentence to like, you know, make me fall in love with you or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but speaking of the like the J.K. Simmons thing, how did he get to the wedding in the first place? <laughs> that was the question I had um, because okay. you know he wasn't with any of his family there at the wedding, right? right. So he. Yeah, but he's grilling out and like hanging out. So obviously, no one was getting ready for a wedding in Irvine when Correct. Andy Samberg went there. So and having to drive to, to Palm, Springs. Palm Springs, exactly. Yeah. By the way, about the run-on sentence thing, I thought that was pretty damn yeah. funny. The way he, he put that no, together, it, it was. It was. It, I think the comedy. In, good. I think the comedy in this movie is, is good. I think the the you know the dialogue and quippy stuff is funny. Um, but I do agree with you that that love story is not reciprocated it's a one-sided love story right exactly and you know at least in groundhog day you could see how she uh would be interested in this you know very gregarious and selfless guy or whatever and that's how you know that turns the corner on that one and he can play some chicago blues like nobody yeah (laughs) and uh exactly and and uh and at that little dance or whatever they were having there, it's like everyone kept stopping him every 10 seconds to like, thank you. Know, you. Thank, thank you for thank saving you, thank you, my husband. Saving my husband's life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for saving our marriage or whatever. It's the boy uh, from the auto club. <laughs> 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 exactly. In, in, in this one, they had the sort of like love story for a while. They had a relationship ending argument over nothing at the side of the road. And then, uh, you know, she gave up on him for you know ten thousand years to go learn quantum physics and uh, experiment with a goat, and couldn't tell him for dramatic purposes. And uh, you know, so it, I don't know. It just it's a lot of that that sort of third act stuff that like didn't quite come together. And 
you know, especially if it's sort of about uh, him finding his Irvine. Well, you, and, we, we, uh, I think we living where we live is just a personal vendetta against Irvine. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> uh, but like, but because of the sort of like these sort of stated goal of, of what they're up to, finding finding their Irvine, like, well, let's do that for both of them. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. her practical consideration of just, you know, finding a way to blast them to the other side. Well, blast thing. her to the other side. She wasn't going to bring him with. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's right. That's she right, needed right. the run on sentence in order to be convinced. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no. She she came to tell him about it and was like, "Hey, you want to come with?" And oh, he's like, you're right, "Oh, yeah. no." You're right. Yeah. And then he needs the run on sentence to uh, make it worthwhile to get out of the loop. Anyhow, yeah. I, going back to the uh, the J. Jonah Jameson character, uh, <laughs> like he shows up at the at the wedding. Are you being a dick to the bartender? So presumably, he, and until he got stuck in the loop, he would have been there every night, presumably. That's what I got out of that. And then it's like, okay, so he went to the wedding alone because his family wasn't going. Yeah. And so every day in Irvine, he has to say, hey, honey, I'm not going to that wedding that I was going to by myself right. in Palm Springs. <laughs> I mean, I can forgive it because it's J.K. Simmons, though, man. I think the guy's great. I think he's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I feel like they kind of left that one open, and it, and maybe there's something I'm not considering or a detail I missed. Same. But like, I, 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 no, I, I agree with you. So, I mean, we're both not considering it if it's there, but I don't think it's there because yeah. this is the second time I saw it, and I did have the question the first time because I didn't. I didn't see his wife at the wedding when they do the flashback to wh- who he was. His name Carl, or it was like one. Yeah. Um, but when they Roy, when they, what? Roy. Roy. When they go back to when they first met, you know, he's fully tuxed out, like he's fully weddinged out. But when then when he go to yeah. to Irvine, he's not going anywhere. He looks like he's pretty. He's got a beer in his hand. He's got some steaks or something on the grill. He's watching his kids, and he's like, right. I don't. I mean, he he found his sort of zen. He found his Irvine. Okay, fine. Maybe, when we see him there, maybe we don't get it that he was, you know, leaving his family or wasn't around for his family. And the reason he went to that wedding was because it was a friend's wedding, and he got to get away from his family. Maybe there was more, right? To that. Which is why it was like easy for him to, you know, snort crystal or whatever the hell they were doing. <laughs> like, exactly. I mean, Confucius said, "Marriage is a bottomless pit of sorrow that makes you forget who you are." But there is a bottom, my friend, and it is a fucking dark place. I like all the different colors that they had on their nose after they were banging all those pills. Like, just everything under the sun, they were probably snorting. Right. right. Uh, exactly. You want to do a bunch of drugs? Yeah. This guy's got him. He walks right up in the middle of the, the wedding and gets, they're right here. Right, right, right. Oh, God. Okay. I, I think that's what it is. So, so, so Andy Sandberg needed to, like, find a reason to live. And ostensibly, it was because, you know, he, he fell in love. So, okay, Love Conquers All for Andy. You know, for Kristen uh, Melody or whatever her name is, um, she hated herself and had to, like, you know, sort of get come to that term. part. Yeah. C- come to terms with that. I, I mean, did she? Uh, and then she <laughs> goes and, like, you know, hugs her sister and all this stuff and, and gives that, that speech and all these other things. Okay, cool. But um, it would have been great... If since we have two characters experiencing this time, well, really three, you know, but Roy's not really a character. But we have two characters experiencing a time loop. You know, have them have their stories come together toward the end, and like it, it, it just felt like we're really sort of loose and like disconnected. Yeah. Um, and speaking of like sort of some of the casting stuff, like this this cast was also pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like Peter Gallagher and yeah. uh, you know June Squibb was in it, and um, uh. Connor O'Malley's in it too. Uh, he's uh, he's one of like Sam Kimbrell's uh, favorite uh, comedians. <laughs> like the the one with, anyway, <laughs> the one yeah, the, the hard part in his hair that was like he got yeah. really freaked out at, at, at times. Um, yeah, exactly. Because of the earthquake, right? He's like, I should never have left the Midwest. Oh, yeah. I should never or the Great Lakes. I should never <laughs> yeah, have left the Great Lakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that guy's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then the, uh, uh, the 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 actual groom, uh, he's our current television Superman at the moment. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> On one of the CW or I didn't w- realize there was a, a current Superman. <laughs> there is a new uh, television. So yeah, he's a on- new Lois and Clark. 
it is something like that. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but yeah, something like that. That's funny. Yeah, so I guess overall, I, I really did, you know, for um, a movie that you could just kind of forget or like just put on Hulu because it's a, you know, free thing and you're already paying for the subscription. <laughs> I think it's a good movie. Um, I think that, I think Andy Samberg's funny. I thought Kristen Melody was good yeah. too. Um, yeah. I think the writing was, was pretty well, at least like in the dialogue and the jokes and things like that. I thought a lot of them no, hit. For sure. I love the girl from, um, man, the show on HBO we were talking about before. Uh, uh, oh, the well, the, the, the blonde Andy's Andy Zamberg's girlfriend. Yes. yes, she was in Search Party. Search Party. That's the the one. Yeah. I think she is so funny and so talented, especially yeah. in Search Party. Although I, yeah, she was a little underutilized too. I right? do I, think I, she was I, underused. Yes, I, I agree. That, yeah. That's what I was, I was trying to get at with like the whole casting. It's like yeah. I, I feel like I wanted more of, of sort yeah. of some of these other characters. I mean, not that the characters themselves were great, but like but the, Peter the, Gallagher and, yeah. and Andy Samberg <laughs> hooking up for the one time, you know, and he's yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> Yeah. That was he's hol- like just kidding. That yeah. was hilarious. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Ew, that's so great. I love that. Um, yeah, I, I I thought that the cast was good. Um, I thought that um, you know a lot of the stuff was great. I do think that you know when you in these two movies, uh, I'm sorry, Edge of Tomorrow and Palm Springs, how you do kind of create this. Uh, I don't want to say finite, but like tangible thing that's creating this time loop. I think mm-hmm. that kind of takes me out of it uh, a little bit. And I, I start thinking mm-hmm. about that a little bit more than I do think about what's going on in the story. You know, then I start thinking about like this living thing that's doing this stuff as opposed to focusing on the characters like I could in Groundhog Day. Because there wasn't, it was so, what is it, omnipotent? Or is that uh-huh. is that not the right word? Just uh, omnipresent or something that's... Mm-hmm bigger than life, you know, that, that we can't even describe or define. That's what Groundhog Day is. Well, these are, yeah. it kind of takes me out of like the grand vision of, of what, you know, could be or, you know, why this happened. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it, it definitely puts it more in the space of like, yeah, I mean, you got to satisfy the plot elements because the sort of mysterious and the omniscience or the, the omnipotent power of it all. And like the, the sort of grandness and like, you know, it is this, uh, a karmic thing or, you know, God punishing you, you know, like all the questions you have in Groundhog Day. Well, the, none of that can really exist in these ones uh, because it's a very finite thing. You're like, you're saying like, oh, the Omega resets the day when the, and the alpha gets killed or something. Yeah, literally it's finite. And, it's beginning and end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and, and then in Palm Springs, it's like, oh, an earthquake, you know, shakes loose uh, a magic cave and you can't get out of it or whatever. And, because of that, yeah, you're right. Like you, you're sort of like then reliant on sort of the mechanics of the plot and like yep. the the way that some of those things are to, to sort of make it feel satisfying. And and I I agree. It's like there's a lot of great stuff in here. Uh, great dialogue, great character moments. A lot of sort of um, never growing up uh, type of thing where it's like you know you're you're a little too old to be acting that way type of thing. And there there is some of that sort of in the theme there and that that's interesting uh it just it, it feels like we needed a, another pass on that third act uh just for character development i mean because you know dialogue wise and everything else we i think we nailed it and casting the, like the filmmaking it was all good mm-hmm. oh yeah um you know they had the sexy bee like shots hilarious in the, moments. In the pool the sexy those uh yeah. bird's eye view sexy <laughs> bee shots uh, yeah. i love that he's he's on a big pizza Roast. slice Big pizza slice oh, inflatable yeah. thing, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's it's a that's a good punchy ending, I think. Um, and you know exactly, there, there's no ambiguity there, right? They made it, and it's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that's a good moment. And same thing with Edge of Tomorrow. I think these two movies end very similarly. It's you know mm-hmm. the next or that familiar thing that you see to start the loop, and then it it it's just a little bit different, right? They're still in the in the pool or whatever, you know, doing that thing that they did all the time. But there's right. somebody else that says something that you know is new. Well, it, and it's funny because like I know it was there to like, okay, is it going to fool you into thinking, oh no, they didn't make it or whatever? But like, you know, I I guess I I didn't I wasn't sold on that part of it. Uh, I don't know, but anyway, it doesn't yeah, matter. no, no, yeah, definitely. How can we sum up the the Groundhog Day experience in film? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, th- I think we did kind of touch on this a little bit, which is that like if the whole 
movie is supposed to offer a little more uh, something to chew on, uh, you know, you'd kind of leave the looping a mystery and then how you get out of it is sort of how you're able to interpret it. You know, if it becomes these mechanics of the plot, well then I feel like, you know, you really need to sort of make that plot very satisfying and, and, and feel like uh, you sort of earn your ending and all these other things. But it, it is an interesting genre in the sense that like you have only one or in this case two consequential characters and everyone everyone else has to be able to reset and that you can't you can't have the plot devices of someone else reminding someone of this or that you know so him sort of figuring out Andy Sandberg sort of figuring out that uh Kristen Malati was uh sleeping with the the groom or whatever uh you know that was an interesting way that they were able to you know solve that mystery with the perfume or the the body spray smell yeah yeah exactly he knew the exact name of it yeah yeah (laughs) well he's been living there for a million right, and a exactly. half years. So, <laughs> um, what else is interesting about these three in particular? You know, okay, so so Groundhog Day kind of established this in the popular imagination as as a as like a, a genre, a subgenre of time travel movies. But it's interesting. So in Edge of Tomorrow, you know, we had two characters that experienced the time loop, but not at the same time. Mm-hmm. And in Palm Springs, we had two two characters uh, experiencing at the same time. Uh, well, actually, three characters, <laughs> but uh, right. you know, sort of two main characters experiencing it at the same time. So it kind of like you know was able to just kind of push the thing forward a little bit uh, genre wise. Yeah, I guess I think I don't think Edge of Tomorrow would have been able to work uh, without someone that had experienced what Tom Cruise experienced. Because if it was the Bill Murray situation, where I mean, as far as we know, according to this film, he's the only one that this has ever happened to, at least in Punxsutawney at that on, at yeah. that particular time. <laughs> um, so having Tom Cruise just go through this without any sort of, um, I guess, link to, you know, someone that would believe him would not work. You know, there'd be no way that he could convince anybody that this is happening. (laughs) No way. He'd be screwed, you know? But yeah, um, overall, I thought that these were all, they're all good films. Obviously, they all follow that same format that Groundhog Day did. Um, They all follow that same beat of there's like this moment where the person that's, we're following that's going through the loop needs to like learn something or like build up to a, a mm-hmm. certain point or a certain level of experience. Really? I keep calling them video games, but yeah. they, <laughs> they kind of are, um, you know, the genre kind of feels like that. It just feels like you're, you're doing something over and over and getting better, which I relate specifically to, to video games. And I mean, edge of tomorrow is right on the nose with that, but um, yeah, no, it exactly. all, they all have that same progression, if you will. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that's true, and I, I think you know, there's obviously, particularly in, in Groundhog Day and Palm Springs, because uh, it it seems more um, more similar to uh, the world we experience. You know, it it has that sort of metaphor of like, oh God, you know, every day is the same. I get up and get my coffee, and I do this, I do that. <laughs> you know, like the routines we get into, right? Right. Um, and and there is definitely something that that's like fun to explore there about sort of, you know breaking out of those routines you know which is more or less what happens in a lot of these stories uh whether it's in a time loop or not but then it's made sort of more literal in uh in, in these time loop movies what would you do if nothing that you did mattered no that sums it up for me all right next week we will be looking at how did we put it were these sequels that were actually good? Is that? <laughs> I think yeah. that's how we text. <laughs> I think that's how uh, Adam put it. Yeah. Sequels that are actually good. We're looking at Psycho Two from 1983, Ghostbusters Two from 1989, and Predator Two from 1990. We are having two weeks of both Bill Murray, Bill Paxton, and Harold Ramis in a row here. <laughs> this show's great. Yeah, uh, it'll be pretty fun. I I think part of it was that like. These are movies where you didn't want a sequel, but that, uh, at least in Adam's opinion, were all pretty good. <laughs> yeah, there is a big disclaimer on this one. We did not choose this. This is a guest uh, programmer. Adam Ferberg yeah. will be joining us. But I've never seen Psycho 2. H- have you seen Psycho 2? Uh, I've, I've only seen the sort of uh, riff tracks uh, version of it, okay. which is kind of like Mr. Science Theater. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, you might want to watch it without the commentary this time. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs>
Thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. Ciao. I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's block we call The Groundhog Sees Its Genre. Let's go on, boys. You're playing yesterday's tape.